Again, if you're just joining the call, we ask that you please complete the survey or the poll that is available on your screen and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Okay, just for the sake of time, we'll just give it a minute, another minute, and then right at 11.05, we'll get started. I almost wish we had some hold music. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I think we're still seeing people come in. Again, if you see the poll, please review and answer the question. Okay, I'm seeing 11.05 on my clock, so I will just go ahead and get started. Thank you for those who completed the poll. Just gonna share the results. So it looks like we have a few administrators, some students, um, industry, faculty. Um, so great, I think you all are in for a wonderful presentation and I will just go ahead and get started, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Academy of Inventors Scholar Share webinar series. My name is Jade Stewart, and I currently serve as the Na director of NAI. For those who may not be familiar, the National Academy of Inventors is a member organization comprising U.S. and international universities, government agencies, and nonprofit research institutes. With over 4,000 individual inventor members, fellows, and senior members spanning more than 250 institutions worldwide. The NAI was founded in 2010 in Tampa, Florida to recognize and encourage inventors with patents issued from the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, enhance the visibility of academic technology and innovation, encourage the disclosure of intellectual property, educate and mentor innovative students and translate the inventions of its members to benefit society. We offer a variety of programs for our members and partners, including but not limited to our mentorship platform, Global Academic Inventors Network, commonly referred to as GAIN, 
which connects students, researchers, and faculty from across the world. Technology and Innovation, our multidisciplinary journal that's published in-house. We produce four issues a year on various topics. From Campus to Commerce, a video series featuring early stage innovation that takes place at our member institutions, such as the invention of plant-based protein alternative beyond meat from the University of Missouri. We also offer two recognition and award programs, fellows and senior members. We're still accepting nominations and encourage you to submit an application or nominate a peer for these awards. Our organization is committed to using its platform to help minimize barriers and promote an inclusive environment for all, especially through these programs I mentioned and beyond. Though we were not able to have our annual meeting this year, we are excited to present our virtual Scholar Share series, the first of its kind for our organization. Today's webinar is titled, Sustainable Additive Manufacturing of Nano and Microelectronics and Sensors. And I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Ahmed Busnana is the William Lincoln Smith Chair Professor, Distinguished University Professor, and Founding Director of the National Science Foundation Nanoscale Science and Engineering Center for High Rate Nano Manufacturing. He's also um, the Advanced Nano Manufacturing Cluster for Smart Sensors and Materials since 2015, or worked previously there. Prior to joining Northwestern University in 2000, he was a professor at Clarkson University, and he is also internationally recognized for his work on nanoscale de defects in semiconductor fabrication. He specializes in directed assembly-based nano and microscale printing of inorganic and organic conductors, semiconductors, and dial electrics for making micro and nanoscale devices. His research support exceeds 58 million, and he's authored more than 600 papers in journals, proceedings, and conferences. He has been granted um, close to over 20 patents, US patents, and has over 40 pending patents. And he's also a fellow of NAI. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ahmed Busnina. Thank you. Thank you, JD. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, start with the, uh, usually I introduce myself, but thanks to JD, I don't have to do that. Uh, I will be talking about new technology um, that uh, can, be made, can be used to make uh, electronics and sensors. So I'm going to share the outline of the, of the presentation first. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk first about the motivation. Why do we want to do this? And about the current additive technology and how it compares, uh, and and then talk about the technology. How does it work? So we're going to start with one technology, and then we have a, a a variety of approaches to do the printing. So I'm going to talk and explain each one of them, and then I'm going to talk about the sus sustainable uh, part of the technology. Why is it sustainable? And then we go through a few applications: uh, display, electronics, MEMS, and uh, sensors. And then after that, we'll talk about how do you scale it? How do you make it fully automated? How do you go to large substrate? How do you make uh, uh, continuous uh, automated process? So we'll start with the uh, motivation. I worked in the semiconductor industry for more than 25 years, uh, not at the industry, but uh, as a researcher supporting the industry. And I worked with every process you can think of, uh, from CMP to etch to uh, CBD to PBD and so forth. So I'm very familiar with the technology. And, and, uh, and you look at the commercial electronic manufacturing, it's very expensive. Plants cost, uh, one fabrication facility costs up to 17 billion and it requires massive account quantities of water and power to operate. And that adds to 1 billion a year. Also, I recall 1990, everyone was concerned because the cost of a single fab jumped to 1 billion. Uh, and uh, fast forward to uh, 2017, the cost was 17 billion. TSMC is planning to build a new fab uh, that would be the three nanometer node, uh, and that will uh, estimate it to cost over 20 billion. If you look at the chart at the bottom right of the slide, this is from The Economist, and it shows the number of leading edge chip manufacturing firms, not much plants, this is actual companies that actually make chips. Uh, in 2001, there was uh, close to 30 uh, uh, companies that make uh, uh, leading edge chips. Fast forward to 2018, 
there's only five left. Why is that? Well, because of the cost, the huge cost of infrastructure. Uh, just to give you the sustainable and the energy used uh, and these uh, uh, using this conventional manufacturing approach, a typical fabrication plant uses as much power in a year as 50,000 homes and can consume more electricity uh, than auto plants and refiners. So, uh, so this is one motivation, the financial and environmental cost. The other motivation, which was really sort of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, our, uh, sorry, this. Uh, that was really our uh, original motivation is this started with the nanotechnology initiative, which started in 1999. And, and this was uh, uh, given uh, uh, rise because of the new nanomaterial that people have been discovering uh, from carbon nanotubes at the time to quantum dots, to nanoparticles, to 2D materials. And at the time, uh, there was no technology that will enable uh, um, us to take uh, these new materials and integrate them into electronics and sensors. So we thought about uh, bringing a new technology and developing a new technology that will let us use any material on any substrate. And, and that means mixing organic and inorganic materials, mixing uh, nanotubes with metal, mixing uh, biomaterials, mixing polymers, a, a variety of things. And, and why is that motivation? Well, two motivations. One is that we want to enable people to take advantage of the novel and unique properties of nanomaterials in actual applications. The second one is to have a robust and uh, versatile uh, technology that can um, that that the designer, if you're designing a sensor or electronics, you will not be limited by the the material that is available in a regular path. You can have freedom to choose any material that works best for your industry uh, for your uh, device. Uh, so, what about the current printing processes? Well, there was a lot. There's a lot of uh, current processes that people use, and for example, the flexographic, uh, gravier. Uh, as you see here, inkjet, screen printing, all these technologies have been used. Some of them have been used for urban packaging, for example, uh, for the last 20 to 30 years. Inkjet uh, was more um, in the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years, started used, uh, being used in electronics and so forth. So we already have printing and printing of, of electronics, regardless of the technique, typically is estimated to uh, be about 10 to 100 times less than conventional fabrication. Now, so what's wrong with that technology? Why can't we use that? And, and there's no need to develop a, a new technology. Well, the problem is that the most advanced uh, 3D printing uh, and inkjet-based printing of electronics is limited. Uh, the best ones that can buy commercially can go down to about 10 microns. And just to remind you, 10 micron was the feature size and the line width in the first Intel microprocessor the Intel 4004 in 1970. So the technology, the printing technology right now is more than 50 years old. And so, uh, and so basically uh, we need a technology that will print at the same uh, feature size that we use now in our computers and in our phones, which is around 20 nanometers or so. Some of, the, some of them memory is a little bit less than that. So we need the scalable printing technology that can do nano and micro, that can print conductive, semiconducting, and electric materials, organic or inorganic, down to 20 nanometers. And we want it to be much faster. We don't want to wait for the jet to go back and forth to print. We want it to be at least a thousand times faster than inkjet. And we also need to print multi layers and interconnect these layers. So uh, let's, before we go into the new technology, let's talk about how the inkjet uh, uh, work. So for the inkjet, for example, uh, you have an ink that has particles. These particles could be silver, uh, could be copper, could be uh, other materials, uh, could be zinc oxide, could be uh, silicon, could be a variety of materials that you want to print. And then this solution basically uses an inkjet to squeeze droplets, and these droplets basically uh, will print dots, and these dots, uh, you can print many dots to make a line or to make a square or to make whatever your circuit requires. And then you can see in the, in the, in the uh, 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 schematic here that you have the droplet and then uh, the droplet uh, basically uh, dries up, the liquid dries up, and then you have the, uh, the particles. 
and so basically your resolution is limited to your dot size and and the dot size is usually uh 40 50 nanometer this is the the smallest you can do some people can make it smaller uh, and so it, it is limited by the dot size that your inkjet can actually uh, um, inject our technology does not depend on that does not do that we actually our uh, our uh, 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 technology basically are, 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 are works with the particle, individual particles, down to 30 nanometers. So basically, our limit is basically the particle size. So we can go as small as our particle size. And, and we control each particle individually and not control droplets that has lots of particles. So let me show you a, uh, a, uh, a video here that shows one of the techniques that we use, which is designed to, to, uh, to print on flexible substrates. Here's how the process works. A robotic arm will load the template and blank wafers. The arm takes them to precision alignment stations so they will match up perfectly. The template is sent to an assembly module for the key part of the printing process. The template with its etched circuitry is dipped into a well containing nanotubes or other types of nanomaterials. When an electric current is applied to the well, the nanomaterials are drawn out of the water and adhere to the etched pattern like ink. The newly inked template is aligned to the blank wafer and both are taken to the transfer module where a pressure device presses the two together. In an instant, the pattern that was inked on the template is printed onto the wafer. And like a printing press, the process can be repeated to make as many wafers as you want from the same template. We can use that template thousands of times. And additional layers of circuitry can be added by inking a new template with a different pattern and pressing it against the existing wafers to make more complex electronics. The entire process takes minutes compared to hours in a traditional chip factory. So, so this particular technology is designed to print on flexible substrates. Uh, the next three uh, processes uh, will print on any substrate. Uh, so this one is, is, uh, is uh, nice because it, it, you only do lithography once. So you make the template and uh, you use the template thousands of times uh, to print. And we have been able to print uh, 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 conductors, semiconductors, as well as, as uh, dielectrics, for example, to make devices. And we've been able to make devices using this technology. So it's additive, it's high throughput. Uh, you can do a wafer, uh, the inking of the template takes a minute, the transfer takes a minute, and, and uh, you can align in between layers also. Uh, you can print down to 20 nanometers, room temperature and pressure. Uh, multi-scale, you can have nano and, ma and micro and macro. Um, it's material independent, we've tried a variety of materials, very low energy consumption, and you can see it's one tool basically. Very low capital investment. <clears throat> and this is what the template looks like, for example. You can make flexible templates if you want to use a roll to roll, for example. And you can do carbon nanotubes, you can do nanoparticles, you can do a variety of, uh, of uh, 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 ink or material to print. And I'll show you some examples later on. So, uh, this is to print on flexible substrates. So, the next uh, uh, three techniques will print on any uh, substrate, whether it's flexible or, or rigid substrate. So, this one is electrophoretic uh, directed assembly, which means that you apply a voltage uh, electric field to, to attract the particles. And so, this particular uh, slide shows interconnects. So, we have, uh, we have uh, vias, uh, these are cylindrical holes, that uh, could be in photoresist, resist or could be an oxide or could be in any, uh, any material that, you, uh, that your device requires. And then you, uh, you uh, turn on a, uh, about one or two volts um, and uh, the particles will assemble and fully fill all the, the vias, for example, in this case. And then uh, they would fuse on their own. And, and in about less than a minute, the process is done. And you can do a whole wafer in about 30 seconds to a minute, for example. 
so the question is, uh, do you get complete fusing? Do you have uh, any, uh, any uh, uh, voids, for example? Uh, uh, what kind of structure do you get? Do you get amorphous? Do you get polycrystalline? Do you get crystalline, uh, single crystal? And so uh, when we looked at this, we found that this, uh, this interconnect, this pillar, is about 50 nanometers in diameter and about 150 nanometers uh, high. And so when we took a cross section, we found one gain boundary. And that indicates you have two, uh, it's polycrystalline, so you have single crystal here and a single crystal here, for example. So, so uh, and this was done without any annealing, without any heating. Uh, there was no post-processing here. So the question is, okay, so this looks good, but what about the conductivity? How does it compare to something that's deposited using other, another technique, such as uh, electroplating or CBD? So we actually tried to look at a variety of things, and we got as small as 25 nanometers. This is 25 nanometers in diameter. And we've done copper, we've done aluminum, we've done tungsten, we've done silver, we've done gold, uh, we've done even uh, polymers and so forth. And so uh, to, to check the, uh, the resistance, so we, we made uh, uh, interconnect using uh, these uh, printing process using particles. And it's shown here. And then we made the electroplated gold, uh, the same size, uh, uh, same dimension. And you can see that the resistance is pretty much the same between the two comparison. So this shows, uh, and this is using a, a probe inside an SEM that allows you to measure uh, a resistance of 50 nanometer uh, uh, pillar. That's the one you see here. So it shows that you're actually getting pretty much the same uh, conductivity in the uh, uh, using this process. Uh, you can actually make a variety of things. You can do, uh, this is magnetic material, for example. This is cobalt. This is uh, iron oxide. You can actually use the assembly to make a pillar and then to land the particle on top of the pillar. Uh, you can make all kinds of composite particles, and I'll show some examples of these composite particles, meaning that you can have uh, this pillar, you can have half of it, one material, the other half, another material. We can have three different materials in the same pillar. And this, actually, there are some good applications for that. Um, OK, so now we go to another technique, which um, Let's say that you cannot, you have no way of applying electric field in your process. And you want to also, let's say, make interconnect or make other types of a structure. How do you do that? Well, um, you, you have your structure. It can, your structure can be made using these, these trenches, uh, using photoresist or using uh, uh, trenches in another material that you printed earlier, for example. And what we do here is we, uh, we, uh, we fill the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the features the vias and so forth, trenches, using a, uh, a solvent uh, or something like IPA, for example. And then you put the solution on top of that. And then basically the, you get assembly uh, in about a minute or so. And you can see some of the examples here, for example. Uh, you can make all kinds of structures uh, using this technique. And it's a very fast technique. You don't need anything but the, the feature structure as well uh, and some IPA and your ink solution. And so uh, uh, one of our students did a map of the world using dots. Uh, these dots are about 500 nanometers, or 400, between 400 and 500 nanometers. And these particles are 30 nanometer particles. And, and uh, they're fluorescent particles. And you can see the assembly time in this case was five minutes. Uh, you can uh, adjust your process to uh, have a different uh, uh, time. So you can actually, we found out that you can get the process to work as fast as five uh, minutes. And this is over inches, not over a small area, for example. And, and we have done interconnect using the same process, as you can see here. And the surprising thing here is that this is silver, is that we got single crystal. So the whole interconnect was single crystal. And uh, this has no annealing required. This was just published uh, this early this year. And so uh, we were uh, uh, we're still trying to understand the process, but certainly we have single crystal, no gain boundary, and no annealing required. Uh, okay, so uh, so these two techniques, as you can see, uh, they work very well in doing specially three-dimensional structures like interconnect and other things. Uh, we wanted something even faster than this, and and uh, that that does two-dimensional uh, structures. So we develop another a new technique, uh, which uh, does not use any solvent, does not use anything except uh, patterning 
on the on the surface. So we do patterning uh, using lithography, and then we remove the photo resist, and we just use functionalization. And the assembly basically is very fast. Uh, we have done nano and micro, and this is some uh, assembly using copper. This is some assembly using silver, for example. And uh, the assembly takes about four uh, one minute for a four inch wafer. So you can see the next slide here. You can do alignment. Also, this is two different layers. Uh, this is uh, silver, could be copper or gold or any other conductor. This is a channel uh, for, a, for a FET, for example. And uh, you can do zinc oxide, you can do carbon nanotubes, you can do gallium arsenide, you can do gallium phosphide, you can do uh, zinc selenide, you can do a variety of things. We've also shown that you can do quantum dots. This is uh, the scale here is 13 nanometers. You can do uh, these are 10 nanometer quantum dots. You can assemble them exactly where you want. So that it's a very powerful process that allows you to do a lot of things that it's very difficult to do or impossible to do using conventional fabrication. Uh, this is an example. So this is these are about 37 transistors. Uh, these are basically the source and drain, and uh, done on a four-inch wafer. And uh, each layer takes one minute. So in one minute you can get uh, you know about 37, and you can go up to you know 100,000 or more or a million uh, per wafer, for example. And it still takes one minute per layer. Um, and as I said, uh, we had single structures, uh, single crystal structure built. Uh, you, uh, from metal and from semiconductors. Uh, so the application, I'm going to talk about application, but, uh, but we have tried, I'm, not, I'm only going to focus on electronics and sensor applications. Uh, but uh, basically, we have done a variety of applications over the last 10 years or so. And so with the materials application, this is shielding, metamaterials, antennas, uh, uh, for structures, for example. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, ballistic protection. We've done used the same technique to do batteries. These are high power density batteries, for example. We've done energy harvesting. So you build uh, an antenna to harvest uh, infrared energy. Uh, we've done a lot of flexible electronics, uh, uh, interconnect using carbon nanotubes and nanoparticles. I've showed you the nanoparticle uh, in based interconnect. Uh, we have done um, uh, NEMS uh, or MEMS. Uh, I'm gonna show you uh, some of the, uh, one example, the, the uh, nanoelectromechanical systems. We've done sensors. So I'm going to talk, basically talk about ma mainly the electronics and um, sensor applications. Uh, we work with a lot, a lot of companies. We have an advanced nanomanufacturing cluster, and we have uh, a variety of companies that are members and that we work with uh, uh, on developing this technology for the specific pur purpose of making uh, sensors. Uh, the technology basically uh, have uh, we had a lot of uh, awards for the technology. Um, uh, you can look those up, but we features in uh, Wired magazine, R and D one hundred, uh, Print Electronics uh, Best Academic R and D Award. Uh, we had the ASME uh, Manufacturing Technology Award, and uh, this is the first generation. I'm gonna uh, that I showed you in the video, and uh, this generation uh, can print a thousand times faster and a thousand times smaller than inkjet or 3D uh, printing. So uh, for the sustainable part, uh, this is just a summary of what uh, this technology means and, uh, when you compare it to conventional technology. So this is a directed assembly based nano and micro scale printing, room temperature and room pressure, and uh, with alignment and high throughput. And so uh, we can print a lot uh, from nano, uh, 10 nanometer or 20 nanometers to hundreds of microns. Uh, the the captain equipment cost is about uh, at least 10x compared to current uh, factories, for example. You also have about 10 to 100x heat per manufacturing cost compared to conventional technology. It's about 10 to 100 times faster compared to current manufacturing technology. I'm not comparing it with printing now, I'm comparing it with the traditional uh, semiconductor manufacturing. The material use is reduced by about a thousand X. It's more than a thousand times faster than inkjet or 3D printing. Eliminates high energy deposition processes such as CVD, PVD, ALD. Eliminates hundreds of process steps compared to conventional technology. And a lot, gives you a lot of freedom in what materials you can use for your specific design needs. And, and also we're looking at biodegradability and repurposing uh, uh, in terms of the sustainable part of it. So uh, we did a study 
using a, an earlier assembly technique, which I didn't talk about, which is slow technique. And, and, uh, and the study basically was published and it shows that uh, it's about 10x less that the energy, uh, the embodied energy and the cumulative energy demand for the printing was about 10x that was published in this paper. Now, when we look at the, uh, do the calculations again with the fast fluidic assembly that I showed, the last one I showed, uh, it looks like it's 25x times less cumulative energy, the, uh, energy than, than uh, traditional uh, uh, conventional fabrication of semiconductors. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the printing. I'm going to show a lot of examples here. I'm going to start with the LED and then touch display and then talk about uh, transistors uh, and uh, NEMS and then finish with sensors. So uh, a lot of you probably have seen uh, micro LED and some devices. Uh, and the way they do them, they make the LED in a wafer using thin film deposition and etching and so forth. And then they do pick and place and put it on the display platform, whether it's a TV or a device or uh, uh, you know, a portable device and, and, or smartphone and so forth. And so this is a really difficult uh, problem. Uh, and when they pick and place, sometimes uh, the LED falls and sometimes it doesn't uh, uh, land at the specific location that you want to land it in. And so we looked at this and we said, well, you know, why can't we print on the platform directly? Why do you have to do a wafer and then go use a robot to pick and place? And, and these things are very small. These things are about 20, nanometer, 20 micron, 10 micron, and so forth, these, each individual LED. So we use the same interconnect technology. But in this case, we did not use metal. We used uh, uh, a two six semiconductor, which is in this case zinc selenide, and and you uh, you do the the p dope part. You print the p dope part first. Then you, you I'm sorry, you print the n dope part first. You print the p dope the p dope where the where the light comes out, and and you uh, you print them on a conductor, and then basically you uh, you connect them. Uh, you have a transparent uh, uh, conductor at the top, and you have a conductor at the bottom. And then uh, it gives you uh, uh, the, the light. You can see this is blue light, zinc selenide gives you a blue light. And you can see it behaves uh, exactly as it's supposed to. Um, and it lights up when you reach three volts. Between three and five volts, you get light um, in, in this one. So this one basically is 15 nanometers, very, very small uh, LED. And uh, this is a very simple process. There is no annealing required. No annealing was done here. You print the first layer, you print the second layer, you put the transparent conductor, you're done basically pretty much after that. Um, we also uh, were challenged by uh, a company that works with uh, Apple and make the touch display for the Apple iPhone. The Apple iPhone has a geometry just like this one. It's a two micron lines with 100 micron spacing. Some of them have 200 micron spacing. So they challenged us to print it on a flexible substrate. The, the Apple prints it on a flexible substrate PED that goes under the, the glass, the Gorilla glass, the Corning Gorilla glass that's on your iPhone. And so basically uh, uh, we printed, we took PAT substrate, we printed uh, this one and we showed that it's transparent. Um, and so this is the change in transparency. You can see it's about two, 3% transparency loss uh, total. And then uh, they said, well, you know, these are two microns. So actually if you put them in a virtual reality example, you can actually see the lines. Why can't we make them smaller than the wavelength of light so you cannot see them at all? If you use a virtual reality or a uh, you know type setup with your uh, smart device, so we did that. We we went and we said let's go from two micron to three hundred nanometers, and we've been able to print the display in three hundred nanometers. This was published late last year, so you can see you can print all these things at a, any scale you want. Uh, the only thing we use uh, in common with the semiconductor conventional fabrication technology is lithography. That's the only thing. Um, electronics, we made a lot of electronics. There are some electronics that I'm not including here that are inorganic. Hopefully we'll publish them soon. Uh, but uh, this is uh, using molybdenum disulfide, which is a 2D material, similar to graphene. This is using uh, an inverter using carbon nanotubes, which is 1D material, and using molybdenum disulfide, which is a 2D material as a complementary inverter. Uh, these are basically carbon nanotubes used as a transistor. You can see this was used in perylene. You can wrap up the, uh, uh, the, you can hear, you can see it here, you can wrap the, uh, the, the substrate, which is only 10 micron thick on your finger. And this particular uh, example here is a, uh, uh, 
this was done on silicon in this case. And so uh, uh, this one has a uh, on a ratio of 10 to the fifth. By the way, uh, if you're um, wondering uh, with the, uh, with the uh, on a ratio, basically we can get up to 10 to the sixth uh, for uh, uh, a two six semiconductor, for example. Uh, we also, you can print uh, organic uh, transistors uh, very easily. You can also print in single crystal. And uh, organic transistors usually have a low on off ratio. So we got up to 10 to the fourth, for example. Uh, uh, this is uh, for a uh, uh, transistor using uh, metal and the organic transistor. Uh, this particular one is using the, the, the first technique that we use uh, where you, you do a, use a template and you transfer. And uh, this is using carbon nanotubes as the electrodes here. So this is the template. This is the template after ink with carbon nanotubes. And this is the, the printed carbon nanotube source and drain on polyurethane, as you can see here. Uh, I included all the references here. So if you would like to look at uh, some more. So this one basically actually was published this year. Uh, this one is a, is a switch. It's a MEM switch. Uh, it is a... Uh, 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 it's a switch that uses carbon nanotubes, for example, and it's a switch uh, that you can turn on and turn off at the same uh, voltage. So it's about four volts. You can turn it on, and then it becomes a non-volatile memory. So it stays. If you want to turn it off, you turn a, a, a trench next to it, and and so here, when you turn it on, the voltage is on. You turn the voltage off. It's still connected. So so you have your state one, or uh, uh, it's already there. It's non-volatile. And then when I go to state two, you turn the trench next to it on, and that pulls it like a rope. And then you get uh, you get your state two, and then we turn the voltage off; it still stays. Uh, so this was published uh, this year. And and why do we do this? And and obviously this is uh, very very large. You can see the scale here. Well, the advantage for this technique is that this kind of technology it is fast. It's it's uh, a few nanoseconds with switching, but it's not affected by temperature at all. You can go to hundreds of degrees. You can go 300 degrees, 400 degrees. It's not going to be affected. If you take your flash memory and you go to 200, your memory is gone. Basically, any data you have there is gone. And and also, it's not affected by electromagnetic waves. It's not affected by um, acceleration or anything else. So it's a very robust technique that can withstand very harsh environment uh, for uh, especially for memory applications. Uh, let's talk about sensors, which is the last item. Uh, so these are examples of some of the sensors. Uh, we're making. So I'm going to talk about a couple of sensors. Uh, the first one, and this sensor was made for the oil industry. And this sensor, it was made, uh, it's a carbon nanotube sensor, functionalized by four amino tempo or tempo molecule. And uh, the, the, mo the chemical molecule on the, on, the, uh, 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 on the carbon nanotubes interacts with a hydrogen sulfide. And so the resistance will increase when there's hydrogen sulfide. So you can see here, uh, when you have 10 ppm of hydrogen sulfide, the current goes down, which means the resistance uh, increases. And then when you, uh, when you uh, uh, expose it to air, it goes up. And you keep, repeat, keep repeating this. And basically, the same thing uh, happens, and the base resistance stays the same throughout. And we had sensors that this is, uh, was done a few years ago. We still have sensors made two, three years ago, and they still work. Uh, we also use the same sensor platform, uh, except this is uh, looks at the increase in current because uh, for glucose detection and lactate detection from sweat, uh, the interaction between the glucose lact uh, oxidase and glucose or lactate oxidase and lactate produces electrons. So as a result, your current goes up, not down. And so you need a conductive nanotubes here. So this works also with sweat, and this was tried actually on... Uh, uh, by very large companies and uh, uh, people have used it while exercising and so forth, and it it uh, it maps very well with the with the uh, concentration in sweat. Okay, so uh, let me talk about the scalability. So the market size, of course, this is a slide that we usually use uh, when we started a company, and uh, what the potential is. So this is the market size for the semiconductor, for example. 470 billion for display, 140 billion for sensors, uh, 150 billion. And this is the uh, advantage, for example, any material, um, very small features, uh, low cost, uh, high yield, low cost, for example, a resolution nanoscale. And for sensors, of course, you have a lot of optimal materials. And, and so uh, 
it is scalable. Uh, we have done a variety of material. We've shown that we can print a variety of materials in an additive way. And uh, the applications that we were involved in were uh, RF, uh, interposers, interconnect. Uh, we've done a variety of semiconductors. I just seen some of those here. Uh, uh, we've also done carbon nanotubes and 2D nanomaterials. And the idea is to have what we call a fab in a tool. So you have your own fab in one tool. This tool is about uh, it's about four feet by eight feet uh, size as uh, footprint. And so basically you can do your printing, you can do your, your alignment, uh, you can do lithography, you can do everything in one tool. It's like a whole fab in one tool that goes into one, uh, one room of, in a facility. And, and that allows you to do a trusted foundry, feasibility study or even production. And it's a turnkey device fabrication, basically, that you can do a variety of uh, 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 circuit uh, parts, um, components, transistors, inverters, capacitor, diodes, inductors, uh, photonic devices, and a variety of things. Uh, so this is what, what it looks like, for example. You can see a person standing right next to it. And it has its modular. So you have one module for assembly. If you do a transfer, you have one module for transfer. You have alignment and registration. You have one module for... Uh, uh, annealing, if you need annealing, for example, you have another module for inspection, for example, and we we work with wafers, so you can put uh, uh, four inch wafer, six inch wafer, or, or eight inch wafers, or larger, if you need. And so basically, uh, you can do any material on any substrate, minimum feature size that we have done down to 20 nanometers. It is fast, and it is uh, less expensive than current technology. So in summary, um, I, I've shown you a disruptive technology for making nano and microelectronics that will change the, the electronics and sensor landscape. Uh, there's still a lot of development needed uh, because uh, a lot of the ink, not all the ink that you want to print is available. Some is available and it's good, uh, good supply and so forth, but some of it uh, needs development depending on what material you want to print. We show five to 10 X reduction in capital equipment cost. And this is because this includes packaging and lithography, includes all the other components of a fab, for example. And uh, 10 to 100x cheaper manufacturing cost compared to current technology, about 10 to 100x faster than conventional technology, and about uh, 1,000x uh, uh, reduction of material use. It is more than 1,000 times faster printing and 1,000 times smaller features than inkjet or 3D printing. And as I said, you can do organic or inorganic, you can do conductive, semiconductor, or insulating. It is sustainable, and we've shown that we can have about 25x energy reduction compared to conventional technology. And we think this will uh, level the playing field. This will democratize nano manufacturing. So you don't need to go to three comp two companies. There are now only two companies, Global Foundries and TSMC, that you can uh, make uh, state-of-the-art uh, feature size electronics down to 20 nanometers. Uh, nobody else does. You cannot find anyone else that does that. Samsung and Intel and Micron still do their own fabrication or on their own devices. And but that's it. These are the only five companies left that can do nano manufacturing at the nanoscale uh, uh, in, in the world, globally, basically. That's it. And uh, an acknowledgement, we acknowledge uh, funding to our partners and uh, Mass Massachusetts Technology Collaborative. And uh, I'm, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you, Ahmed. This was a, a wonderful presentation. I have definitely learned a lot, though I'm not trained in this field. It is quite impressive. And just to hear um, that this is the world's first <laughs> um, printing um, of nano um, technologies of this kind is impressive. And um, I just have a general question about um, how much does this cost in terms of the, the machine itself? Well, the machine itself actually is, is not expensive uh, compared to uh, the machines you buy from applied materials, or uh, which would be uh, you know tens of millions. Uh, I mean, basically, the machine, the, the first machine that I showed, uh, typically is about between one to one and a half million, depending on the options. Uh, for the machine that print on wafers, depending on how much you want with it. If you want to use your own lithography, it's not much more expensive than that. If you want lithography to be integrated, then it, that would double the, uh, the cost, basically. It could be two to three million. Uh, but then you don't need a whole pack. You know, that's it. That's all you need. You need one machine that does everything. That's amazing. Okay, we do have a, a few questions in the queue. 
So I will go ahead and get us started. So if you have questions just um, for the participants, there is a Q&A button near the chat field. And so um, please feel free to submit your question and we will uh, make sure that it's answered and um, submitted. So first uh, question for, um, for you, Ahmed, um, regarding what is applied potential to assemble the nanomaterials in water system? Um, and continuing through this is, does the water oxidize and disturb the process? Have you seen the fractal growth in the particle deposition with application of potential? If yes, how do you control? Um, so there's a few questions there. Yeah, there are a lot of questions. So let me uh, just uh, go through the process. So yes, we use water, but we use solvents also. So the key is, so, uh, so let me back up and, and uh, say this. So any material you can suspend in liquid, you can print. That's number one. So, so the key is that you can get, you have to get the, your material suspended at, at uh, enough concentration. If you're using, uh, if you're using uh, um, convective assembly or electrophoretic assembly, a concentration doesn't have to be high. You can have even less than 0.1 percent concentration of particles in a liquid, and it's the process that works. For the fast fluidic, it requires high concentration, up to 10 percent or higher, uh, and so. With the oxidation, we don't really see oxidation in the water. Of course, it depends on the material. If you put in gallium nitride in the water, it will oxidize. So you do not uh, want to do that for the metal. It doesn't because it has very thin polymer coating that goes away when you anneal. So it is protected from oxidation in water, for example. Uh, you can certainly, you don't have to use water. You can use any other uh, solvent that, that works well for you. Uh, in terms of the... Uh, uh, the, the material, for example, when the particles basically are assembled, they're packed. And, and we found out that uh, I showed you the single crystal structure that did not was not annealed at all. And typically, there are three conditions to have this happen. Is that the particle size has to be small. And then the, another one, you have to have a force to pull the particles together. And this force uh, exists in the first process, the electrophoretic, and the convective interfacial. With the fast fluidic assembly, there is no force that pushes the particles together. So th that doesn't happen in that process. Uh, and when it doesn't happen, we use uh, an annealing process, such as flash annealing or rapid thermal annealing. And both processes work, and we have been able to get single crystal, as large as 8 micron or larger, uh, in, uh, for semiconductors, for example, or for, for uh, other materials, using uh, like rapid thermal annealing, for example. So, uh, so certainly, uh, if you have very small particles and you're using one of those two processes, you don't even need a kneading process. Great. Thank you. And then um, as a follow-up, have you also made non-invasive sensor based on your technology? Um, non-invasive means medically. Uh, so all our sensors are non-invasive, actually. We only made one that was in vivo. Uh, most ours are actually outside, so they uh, it's it's a sweat. So basically, it's like a bandaid you put on, and uh, and the bandaid basically it's about a quarter size uh, the whole circuit, and we have microfluidics to wick uh, uh, sweat away from the skin, and mm -hmm. it goes by the sensor and it wicks out to the uh, evaporates, and so it, it uh, we've tried it for eight hours. We put it on a human subject and. Uh, and basically, uh, you, it's a continuous, so it works with Bluetooth. Uh, it goes to the phone directly, and you can turn it on continuously for eight hours, which you can, or you can you can have it uh, without, without Bluetooth, for example, like a uh, 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 typical network that you activate it uh, by using your phone next to it, and and that means it turns on only when you have your phone nearby, and then you can read it. So yeah, mo most of our stuff is invasive, with the exception of. One thing that we did about 10 years ago, which was a blood-based uh, uh, cancer sensor. Wow. Great. Um, so someone also asked, how do you see the invention impacting the electronic industry in the U.S. specifically? I think that uh, uh, this will probably be adopted initially by people who want to do, uh, uh, believe it or not, we, we will focus most of our work on the really small stuff, like, 20 nanometers, 25 nanometers, and so forth. And we found that people that came knocking on our door are actually people that went one or two microns, not, not, not nanometers. So, 
So the process works. It's just that we didn't spend a lot of time on it, you know, because we mm -hmm. thought, you know, you know, people who used efficient te additional technology, but actually, uh, people who actually want to use printed electronics now have a huge uh, toolbox that they can use to do stuff. So. Uh, people who you use packaging, packaging, of course, uh, use printing and electroplating, and they're now getting into the one micron, two micron, and uh, and uh, that's very expensive, by the way, uh, for some reason. I don't understand why. Uh, so so basically, a lot of smaller companies that want to do printing, they want to do make uh, uh, electronics, uh, can now actually do it. They don't have to pay. <coughs> excuse me. And and uh, for example, if you go to uh, most people say, well, you know, if you are making millions of chips, the price comes down, which is true. Mm -hmm. But uh, what if you have a specific application where you don't need millions of chips? You know, what do you do? Well, you have nowhere to go. You know, if you want to state of the art. And so and so basically, there's a lot of new technology now where you actually everybody wants their own ASIC. You know which is a custom designed chip that does specific things for you. Uh, and, uh, and basically this technology is very nice because you can do thousands of chips, you can do a million chips if you want, uh, but you don't have to pay you know, uh, thousands of dollars per chip. We, we did about 10 years ago, we went to TSMC, which was the biggest semiconductor manufacturing technology uh, company in the world that, does, that, that makes the processors for, uh, for Apple computer, for example. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we made a very simple circuit uh, amplifier uh, for a sensor, chemical sensor. Uh, we just made, uh, we, we designed the, the chip and we sent it to them to do. This was before our process was developed. And so we, we needed 50 chips. They charged us three to $4,000 per chip. Wow. You know, so, so it's very, very expensive. The, the line width in that, in that example was about uh, 400 nanometers, 300, 400 nanometers. And how long ago was that, you said? About 10 years ago. Wow. Um, great. There, I think we have time for a couple more questions. So um, someone wrote, I may have missed this, but what is your expected time frame to launch into market? Well, we're, we're talking to a variety of companies now. Uh, the, the see, the difference be between if you start a company to sell a sensor or a device or something, you have an application that you know what, what people want. But when you're selling a manufacturing process, mm -hmm. uh, the first question is say, what are you going to manufacture? <laughs> well, you're going to manufacture electronics. Well, what about our electronics? Well, each body's electronics is different and the material is different and so forth. So, so it, it, um, we found out when we started the company, we started the company only about two and a half years ago, uh, that, that it's not as easy as we thought because we're not making traditional, conventional, like... Uh, chemical vapor deposition or physical vapor deposition, everybody knows what you use this for. So they just buy it. In our case, it's a new technology. So now we have to prove everything mm -hmm. that, that uh, we have to prove that everything works for their every customer's application. And that means we have to print their own pattern. We have to do uh, uh, resistivity measurements for conductors. We have to do a Hall effect and we have to do on-off ratio. And, and all the measurement for the semiconductor, and we have to do that. And then we have to do it for their own application. So it takes longer and it takes more development time, mainly because we're not working on an end application, we're working on enabling technology. Mm -hmm. But we think that in about a year or two, we will, we, we, you will see our tool already negotiating for uh, uh, government labs and, and universities uh, to buy some of these tools. But we think in companies, it's gonna take at least a couple more years. Great. Okay, I will um, ask this one last question and um, we can uh, summarize the rest of the, the webinar. So um, this individual um, asked what inks are available, or sorry, I'm gonna look at this one. <laughs> can you um, print any desired material and what are the material limitations? That's a good question. Um, so uh, yes, there are some inks available, like for example, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the gold structure that I've shown, the silver structures that I've shown, they're available. Uh, if you, uh, there are many vendors actually uh, 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 that sell it. Uh, uh, but for the other materials, such as the semiconductors and so forth, there are no inks available. However, there are powders available. Mm -hmm. So you can buy the powder and you can suspend it uh, using our technology. That's not an easy task, by the way. Uh, so you need somebody who knows colloid chemistry, you need somebody you need to know how to measure uh, 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 viscosity, you need to know how to measure the uh, uh, 
there's data potential, you need to know how to measure surface tension, you need to know all these things, but it is, but the particles are available. Uh, so what material uh, uh, can we print? Uh, any material that you can suspend in a liquid, uh, you can print. Now, that liquid, of course, if you're using something that oxidizes with water, you have to protect the nanoparticle by uh, our organic coating, for example, that will go away uh, during annealing, which we found out that that actually does happen, and it doesn't affect the, uh, the, the, uh, the resistance or the performance of the, of the material after you print it. Uh, or you use a different solvent that doesn't oxidize it, for example. Uh, but other than that limitation, basically any material, uh, you can do that. Even materials that can dissolve in a liquid, like some of the polymers, like uh, some of the semiconductor, the BT, uh, 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 the, the organic semiconductor that I have uh, shown, that actually dissolves in the liquid. So it dissolves in the liquid, you can actually still print it as well. Uh, so it, it's actually, uh, any, you can print any material on any substrate. Uh, mm -hmm. All the materials that we've tried, we've been successful in printing. Um, and, and like I said, if there's oxidation problem, you change the liquid that you use for that process. Wow, wonderful. Um, well, great. I, there are a few other questions that we did not have a chance to get to, but I will make sure that um, Ahmed, you get them so we can follow up with all of our attendees. Um, but I did want to thank you again for taking the time today to um, share your story and this work and um, invite you to share any last comments or um, you know, advice that you want to give the audience before we, we close it. No, I mean, uh, thank you very much, and thanks to NAI to give me the give me the opportunity to do this. I mean, basically, I, I just want to say this that uh, you know, for from '85, I worked with IBM to scale a, a wafer process from five inch to eight inch, for example. Uh, IBM never used six inch wafers, and and I worked with this process on yield and and uh, until about 2005 or so, when we when we started thinking differently, said, well, this process is getting so expensive and it has limitation materials. How can we, there must be a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. And we wrote a proposal to NSF 2004, got funded. And uh, we had about 100 students, I'm sorry, 80 students and 20 postdocs and about 30 faculty working on this. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, it's not just me. It's a lot mm -hmm. of people, a lot of effort went into this. And, and close to about $80 million were actually uh, was used to, to develop this. So this technology, uh, and we, in 2014, we actually built the first generation because we wanted to automate it because everybody, no one saw how can we scale this up and how can we uh, uh, make the process faster. So we built a tool that's fully automated and we showed that you can print uh, per wafer, fully automated um, in one minute uh, over a wafer, regardless of the density and regardless of the scale or the, or the size of the feature size. Uh, so basically, it's a, it's a motivation. They're saying there must be something better, you know, than this expensive technology. Nothing wrong with the expensive technology. I mean, you know, it, it actually that's what enabled us to get here in the first place, you know. But yeah. but we're just looking for another alternate way that's less expensive to make the same thing. Great. And then lastly, if others want to find more information, where can they go? To learn more. Well, we have we have. A, I mean, they can contact me. My my. Uh, I, I don't know if you, they can see the screen, but uh, this is my email. Feel free to contact me. We okay. have a few websites. So we have uh, uh, two websites: uh, the CSSM, this is the uh, cluster for smart materials, smart sensors and materials, and then we have nanomanufacturing.us, which is the for the NSF center, and then we have the company website, which is uh, nano-ops.net. Uh, uh, nano ops stands for nano offset printing system by the way great yeah so thank you again for your time today we will um, share those resources with everyone after the call but also just want to note that this video has been recorded and will be available for future watch on our youtube channel and we'll share that link with everyone as well so thank you again happy friday eve we made it through another week <laughs> um, but enjoy thank you all thank you very much Thanks. Bye-bye.